Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode, we're going deep into Personal Finance 101 with Liz Weston, nerd wallet columnist and certified financial planner. Talking about money and helping people with their money, setting out a path and saying, okay, this is how you can take control and this is how you can make the decisions that you want to make. And obviously life happens, everything changes. And that's the other thing I like about personal finance is there's always something new to write about. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast, sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Today, we're talking to Liz Weston. Now, I've known Liz for a while because we both wrote for CBS Money Watch and shot some videos together, but she's gone on to do all sorts of interesting things, including being a columnist for Nerd Wallet. She's also a certified financial planner. She's written a bunch of books, five of them. I can't even believe it. And she appears a lot on television and radio all across the country. Now, what's interesting about Liz is that she sort of has a similar background in terms of what she does today, though we come from different roots. So you'll hear a little bit of her origin story. In this episode, we're going to talk about the developments in the student loan crisis, whether or not the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is really going to survive, and the future of Social Security, which I think people really just still don't understand. Don't forget, we've got your listener question of the week. If you'd like to come on the air with us, just send an email, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. Here's the interview. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Well, it's time for the interview, the big interview. And we are so delighted to have Liz Weston, who is an old pal of mine from our old Money Watch days. Liz is a nerd wallet columnist and a certified financial planner. We'll get to that in a minute. Whose goal is to help you get smarter about money so you can get on with your life. She's the author of five books including the best-selling Your Credit Score. She's appeared on a bunch of TV shows, some other networks, which I don't like to talk about. And um, let's see, Dr. Phil. Oh, my God, that's so weird. Um, <laughs> it was weird. It and was bizarre. <laughs> she lives with her husband and her daughter and codependent golden retriever in L.A. What's not on your bio that's really interesting about you? I was a pilot. What? Yes, I learned to fly in Anchorage in Alaska. And managed not to kill myself and then realized I wasn't doing it up to stay safe. But I do. I did get my pilot's license. All right. That's so cool. <laughs> um, we start every interview with this question. You ready? Okay. This is funny for a personal finance journalist to ask this question. What's the best money decision you have made, Liz? Starting retirement saving early. I'm sorry. That's so boring. It is so boring. <laughs> is there anything more exciting? No, I think that's a good one. Yeah. When, when did you start that retirement saving? I was in my mid-20s. So this was not long after 401ks even got started. And I was so ignorant of how they worked that when the 86 crash happened, yeah. I assumed my company had done something to me <laughs> to take away my money. Those bastards. <laughs> exactly. Um, what kind of retirement plan did you use at that time? That was the 401k. And then when the Roth came around, I decided I got to do the Roth. And back then, I, you know, that was not an issue because I didn't make enough money as a, as a reporter to worry about the income limits. And how'd you get into this? How did you become a personal financial journalist? Did you start in this area or did you start somewhere else? No, I mean, actually, I think my first job as an intern was in the business section. And I remember writing about uh, online banking. So again, this is the mid 80s. We're talking way back when. But, it, you know, I did some other things. I was a feature writer in Alaska for a while. I started covering politics. Are you and, from Alaska? No, no, I'm from Washington State. But that Just was sort of Alaska. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Close same enough. Thing. Yeah. It, it wasn't such a big deal to be up there. Yeah. But, you know, and it was a great place to be in my 20s. So wonderful stories. I did Exxon Valdez cleanup. I covered the Iditarod of all things. I mean, just a great place to be. And then I started covering politics and I came down to Southern California to cover politics. And I got sick of it in about 18 months. Really? I wanted to get away from it. Yeah. And then and then when did you start the uh, financial stuff? That was probably 1994, I want to say, that I really started doing it full time. And did you immediately take a, a shine to it, as they say? I did. I mean, I had been subscribing to Kiplingers and money and trying to figure all this out. And I had a mom that was good with money. What did your mom do? She basically avoided debt at all costs. Bank of America dared to charge her an annual fee. Oh, and I no. I remember her chopping up that credit card and putting it in on the envelope. And they sent her a new one and an apology. And they waived the annual fee. She was not going to pay a bank interest or any kind of fee. This began your love affair with the banking sector, I'm sure. <laughs> 
kind of a good message early on. Yes. Uh, so your mom was really good about money. What about your dad? Was he around? Was he also good about money? No, not really. I mean, he'd grown up in a much wealthier family, and I don't think it was really an issue that he thought about. So mom took care of the finances. You know, he brought home the paycheck. It was classic, you know, homemaker, you know, dealing with the, with the money. It's just she was really good at it, and she was also good at investing. So we would get these dividend checks, and that's what we'd go out to dinner on. And dinner, you know, going out was a, was a rare thing. So you got a little taste of the investing world from mom. Yes. Tell me about what draws you to this weird world of personal finance. Why do, why do you like writing about it? Why do you talk about it? I mean, you you are prolific. You you do you've done this for a while. Obviously, you could go to a different beat if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Why do you like it so much? I like it because it makes a difference in people's lives. And I think that's what frustrated me about politics. Is politics was about politics. It wasn't about changing lives necessarily. That was almost seemed like a byproduct. But but talking about money and helping people with their money demystifies something that's scary for a lot of people and setting out a path and saying, okay, this is how you can take control and this is how you can make the decisions that you want to make. And obviously life happens, and but there are ways to kind of insulate yourself from some of the worst things and also take advantage of opportunities. And again, people typically, you know, maybe they got lucky like I did and had a mom that could teach them some of the basics. But even if you had a parent that was, you know, up to date then, everything changes. And that's the other thing I like about personal finance is there's always something new to write about. I like the fact that there's always something new to write about, but you hide the same old advice in there. Like we had <laughs> we had Jason Zweig on the podcast, and he said something like, you know, like, well, you know, I, I basically write about the same 80% of stuff. Yeah. You know, like, well, you know, it, it just it's the same, but you, you can sort of hide it in different ways. I had an er- editor early on who said there's basically 14 personal finance topics or stories, and we just keep recycling them with different anecdotes. When I met you back in 2009 and we were launching Money Watch... CBS Money Watch, and you were writing there, and I was just brought on, and you told me at that time that you had taken or were taking the certified financial planning courses, the modules, five or six, I can't remember when it was when you were doing it, but you hadn't taken the tests yet. Yes. What made you want to take the test? Back when I took the courses, they didn't give the credential to journalists, so I thought, why am I going to put myself through that hell to take a test that doesn't make any difference anyway? So I blew it off. Well, now they do. But that meant I had to go back and cram. So I did an online review. I did this boot camp that was literally 10 hours a day, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, two weeks in a row, just trying to cram that information back in my head. And turns out things change again. So I had to learn new stuff. I had to forget some old stuff. And I also had to learn a bunch of formulas for valuing stocks, which I knew I was never going to use. I'm yeah, a, a passive bummer. investor. And it's like, why am I learning this? And I kind of resented it. When I was in college, I didn't care what they taught me. I just absorb it, you know, and spit it back out. Yes. Now it's like, I don't need this. And I know something more important is being displaced from my brain by this thing. The idea that you were covering this versus being immersed in it, how do you think that it changes your your lens when you are actually a subject matter expert for reals. Like the CFP board has now like crowned you. <laughs> I should also disclose, hello, I am the CFP board senior ambassador. Do you know that? I didn't know that. So oh, I am well done. Senora or senior <laughs> ambassador now. So uh, I'm delighted that you've taken the test. But how has that changed for you? What would that, is it any impact or was it really the coursework that was more important? It really to me was the coursework. I mean, I went into it thinking that any reasonably intelligent woman could handle every aspect of her financial financial affairs. And I came out and I had an insurance agent and a tax pro and I wound up getting an estate planner. And now I have a financial planner myself. You realize what you don't know. And that's probably the biggest asset is that you don't assume that you know everything. You know you have to go to the experts and you don't assume that the experts who are talking to you understand everything either. And I think that's a real advantage. What's your favorite thing that you're covering right now? Give me, give us a little snapshot, a little taste of Liz <laughs> that we can find. And we'll link to Liz's column um, at NerdWallet, which is fantastic, which I use as a resource all the time, by oh, the way. Like, you. hello, I'm not that smart. I don't want to, like, come up with ideas. Aren't there other people I can poach from? Oh, yeah, there's Liz. <laughs> there's Kathy Kristoff. There's Jason Zweig. Mm-hmm. They're writing about interesting things. So what are you writing about or what are you covering right now that's interesting to you? One of the things that's really interesting is something I covered about mid-February which is that the credit bureaus are finally going to drop civil judgments and most tax liens. And this was garbage information. The bureaus knew it was garbage information. People were being sued who didn't know the debt, who didn't even know they were being sued. The identifying information was crap. So these lawsuits were landing in the wrong file. 
And the issue with tax liens is they weren't being updated often enough. So people would pay it off and they would still show as owed. So the bureaus have known for a long time this was bad data. Well, they finally are taking it off. And what's amazing about that, this affects 12 million people, which freaked me out. Like, that is a lot of people who are affected. But isn't it kind of still jaw-dropping that so many people don't go to annualcreditreport.com and check their credit? I mean, it's free now. Yeah. And it's free on a lot of credit card. Um, They have your score Mm -hmm. and you can watch it. But the credit report itself, people aren't going in there and correcting errors, even after all these settlements, even when they can and maybe even get a response. Yeah. It it actually is easier to change things now and get things corrected. But yeah, there's still so many people they've never been to annualcreditreport.com. Or what they do is they type in the wrong thing. What else do you like that's going on right now? What's interesting? Are you free? Freaking out about the potential demise of Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Yeah, right after the election, I did a, a, a just a brief uh, synopsis of what we can expect in terms of the rollback of consumer protections, and I am freaked out. I, you know, I lived through the Great Recession. I see what happens when you just pull everything off the 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 financial services firms, you know, and say, okay, whatever you want to do is fine. The problem is, is that the power is in unequal. And you need somebody writing her. And I think the CFPB has done an amazing job of, you know, trying to rein some in, in some of the worst behavior. And also addressing areas that are were previously just falling outside of the purview of many other regulators. And I should point out to all of my friends who are Wall Street lawyers, some of whom are my significant others, <laughs> uh, that... Sorry, dear. Yeah, I know, right? Sorry, honey. Um, bear with me here. There is always a consumer arm of a various regulator, right? So Mm -hmm. we know that, of course, we know that there is a consumer part of the SEC. Mm -hmm. There's a consumer part of the Fed, of the OCC. Yes, we get that. But there is no one organization whose sole purpose is the consumer. And so while I completely understand how lawyers are freaked out by the CFPB because they're nervous that this now opens up big companies to litigation – On the other hand, it's not as if the regulation that's going on is catching these things. Many of these things are payday lenders, Mm -hmm. auto loans, Mm -hmm. credit Credit bureaus. (laughs) bureaus. I mean, all those are in the purview of CFPB. So I'm kind of crushed by the idea that they're going to basically defang it, right? Is that essentially what they're not going to get rid of it, but they're going to say, man, we're just going to stop giving you money. Well, and this is this is a story to illustrate the difference that it's making is, is early on in the CFPB's history. Uh, somebody was asking me, they were having a problem with the credit bureau, and it was like this bad information just kept showing up over and over and over. And I went through the whole thing. You make a complaint to the FTC, but they won't respond because, you know, they wait for, they have a bunch of complaints, and then they move on. And I get to the end of it, and then it occurs to me, oh, you can just go to the CFPB. And literally, people who went who go to the CFPB with a complaint, the CFPB will connect them with the company to try to work it out. And the companies are afraid of the CFPB. So they actually respond. Things get done. And it's it's, it's to me, it's like a world of difference. It's I huge. wonder I wonder if the view of CFPB would have been different if it were not Elizabeth Warren's brainchild. In other words, if it had been grown organically, because it seems to me like it's such a crazy thing to be against. Yeah. I'm against consumer protections. I'm against <laughs> against seatbelts. Like, I just hate them. But Leah Iacocca was against seatbelts. I know. But <laughs> Back but the then day. there was a real vested interest for him, right? <laughs> this is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Liz Weston in just a second. You know, the topic of consumers is really hot right now. The House has already passed the Financial Choice Act, which would roll back a lot of the regulations that went into place to protect you. They want to actually roll back the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule. And that was the one around retirement accounts. Well, why not deal with someone who already has your back? Betterment is the largest independent online financial advisor. Betterment does not get commissions for recommending mutual funds. They don't have funds of their own. That means they do what they believe is right for you. Betterment is the largest independent online financial advisor. The service is designed to help improve your long-term returns and lower your taxes for retirement planning, 
building wealth, and lots of other financial goals. Betterment makes tailored recommendations like how much to invest or how much risk to take on in your portfolio and the type of investment account you should have. Low transparent advisory fees, a quarter of a percent of assets under management. Why wait for the government to do it? Deal with a firm that does it already. They're not waiting for a mandate. They just do the right thing. And now for a limited time, you can get up to six months managed for free. Learn more at Betterment.com slash better off. And now back to our interview with Liz Weston. Can I shift gears for one second? Yeah. Um, what what about student loans and that market? Are you feeling like there's going to be some change that occurs? Is, is there going to be not even on a regulatory basis, but are people going to just stop getting in so much trouble with student loan debt Mm. or would the lenders start to actually do real underwriting potentially? Wow, that would be interesting. I mean, most of the student loans are still coming from the feds and there's no underwriting. There are limits for undergraduate, not for graduate, as you know. Um, I don't see that changing just because people know that a college education is so important. You want to stay in the middle class in the 21st century, you need some kind of post-secondary education. And you know, right now there's a limit to how much damage you can do with federal student loans. The question is the private student loans, which already do some underwriting and they want those co-signers because they know the co-signers will pay when you default. Um, we still have the issue of the cost just keeps going up and up and up for a commodity that is more and more important. So I don't see anything built in that would stop this. I'm thinking that maybe technology could save us and that like if you get nonprofit institutions, like I think Georgia Tech did a pilot program where they were doing an online um, engineering degree Mm. and it was $7,000. Wow. Okay. And the thing that was interesting, so you had to like test to get in. It was really hard to get into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it essentially ran a, a parallel curriculum to the in-class experience on campus. Mm -hmm. The thing that was interesting about it is they did all of the the finals and the testing and everything, and the online kids did just as well and maybe slightly better than those in class, maybe because they weren't parting their asses off on the weekends, (laughs) but that's okay. But I'm wondering if that becomes our savior, Mm -hmm. that it does, it's not in the next five years and maybe and maybe people who are really rich are going to want to spend 200 grand for their kids to have awesome keggers on the weekend (laughs) but for the vast majority of americans i wonder if that ends up being our saving grace or not that would be interesting i mean because you know all the online universities and schools are out there anything you want to learn you can learn usually for pretty cheap now i i have another perspective i got a dog in this this fight because my husband's a college professor oh well i i mean i'm sure he's wonderful (laughs) He's fabulous. I know. Just, what does he teach? He teaches life drawing composition at Art Center College of Design. So he's teaching the next generation of video game designers, animators. So his kids go out and get actual jobs for, I'm not kidding, six figures. These kids come out and they get these amazing job offers. Yeah, it's so different if that kid is borrowing 100 grand and exactly, my first job no out of school is buck 25, right? <laughs> That's the issue is that the if you if you're coming out with a career that actually makes money but you know his perspective on this is he doesn't want to be beaming himself everywhere and not getting paid for it and that's the problem with the universities is they've got these you know online arms but the professors aren't necessarily getting paid for oh that's more. so interesting so what wait 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 what's your husband's name will will okay so what if we said will here's a deal um if your course becomes really popular we'll do a rev share with you there we go right we'll give you a piece of the action and then all of a sudden you got to actually show up and not just write an academic paper to get paid more and get tenure but you actually have to draw eyeballs to your class i love that idea i do too because he's great at that he's got an instagram account he's got like 80 some thousand followers he's got more followers than i do in all my social media combined wait really a minute annoying. wait a minute can you <laughs> he's gonna tweet this out right we're gonna get this love going here all right so um what else what's the last big thing you want people to pay attention to when it comes to their personal financial lives liz weston uh, of Nerd social Wallet. security i know it sounds snoozy millennials but please pay attention to it they're so convinced it's not going to be there and that's what's going to cause them to lose it because they think it's already gone it is not gone it's so important you need to pay attention to it don't let them take you take it away from you how do you feel like you want to fix social security i have my own game plan but what would you like to do to just get a uh, the numbers in line a little bit. How would you like to fix it? This was really interesting because my answer has changed. I, uh, there was a guy at AARP I sat next to at some event, and we just had this in-depth conversation. And he made the point, which is very important, it has to be everybody. 
you cannot means test it. You cannot make it for one section of the population and not for the other. We're all in this together. It's insurance. That's how insurance works. You got to get that big pool. So I wouldn't do anything that that would means test it or and certainly not privatize it. Um, you know, I do think we need to to lift the the cap on earnings, and that will be painful personally. I'll deal with it. Um, but I think it's important that also your benefits go up, you know, if the cap comes off. Okay. So the cap that Liz is talking about is right now you pay into Social Security FICA taxes up to $118,500. Now, the idea here is that if we lift that tax limit up to from 118 to 150, mm-hmm. let's say, unfortunately, you have to pay into that. Six point two. Is six point two. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. my God, I'm losing. You're already my paying mind. the Medicare, so it would so, be the six. Okay, so you're going to pay six point two percent into that, and now it's going to increase your tax burden, which is a bummer. If you say, let's say, if you make a hundred forty nine thousand dollars a year, all of that's going to be an extra tax. Yeah. Okay, what about raising retirement age? Are you in or are you out on that? Thumbs up, thumbs down. <sighs> this is the problem. Somebody like me can keep doing this forever. Somebody who's got a physical job, they're done at 60. Yeah, what about me? I'm on TV. I'm done, in, <laughs> I'm done next year. <laughs> Look, if you've got a physical job, to say to somebody, you know, even 65 to 67 could be a problem. But um, I think you're probably going to see that be part of yeah. any sort of social security reform. But literally, if you make the if you make the wage base 150 and you raise the age to 70, 72 for the younger ones, you scale it in. You mm-hmm. don't screw with anyone who's over 50 already. Yes. Whew, we made it. <laughs> um, sorry, Mark. Thanks for my social security check, Mark. Um, I think you fix it. Yeah, I think. Well, there's there, we probably do need to bump up the the tax rate. A wee bit, just really? to fix. Yeah, just to. You to want? Close is it. it better to bump the tax rate or raise the wage base higher? Uh, even if you took it the cap off completely, you wouldn't solve the problem. You wouldn't. No. So you'd have to. So we'd have to go like eight percent, or is it? I don't more? think we have to go that high. I mean, I think you could solve it with what did they say? One point five percent on each side. So that would be a three percent raise. Okay, that would, that would be pretty big, though. I mean, yeah, especially if you're lower income. That's right. really regressive. Right. So, well, but, then you got to boost the earned income tax credit. There you go. At the same time. Which we I got, love that idea, by the way. All right. So I'm in. Okay. I, we got tax reform right here on the Better Off podcast <laughs> with Liz Weston and Jill Schlesinger. All right. Uh, final thought here. You ready? Okay. Your very best financial decision, you said, was that you started saving early in a retirement account, which is the like the lamest answer. <laughs> because you are a personal finance journalist extraordinaire and CFP professional. Now you get to come clean with just me, Mark, and the millions of people listening, friends of the pod. <laughs> What's the worst financial decision you made? Oh, there are, there's enough. There's enough. But honestly, the one that haunts me. Uh-oh. My first house that I ever bought was in Laguna Beach, California. Oh, I love Laguna Beach. I love Laguna Beach, too. And we sold it for 470 some thousand dollars which was a profit. We were delighted. The same house is back on the market for $2.4 million. Okay, but wait a second. Let Mark's, Mark is holding his head. Depending on how long ago, that might have just been growing with the rate of inflation. I guess not. It's not that long ago. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But no, I, I wish I could soothe myself that way. I would no. say we're going to have to do like a, um, an interesting review of this because many of our guests talk about real estate as their worst decisions. And it's usually that weird regret thing, which is, oh, I wish I hadn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was funny. I was asking my mother-in-law this question, who's 93 years old. Hmm. And I said, uh, what's the worst finance? She's unbelievably brilliant, ran the household, lots of kids, no student loans. Everything is like amazing, Right. And I said, what was your worst financial decision? And she said, ah, when my husband, my my father-in-law was a civil engineer, and he was uh, the engineer on a big building in New York City, and next to it was a little townhouse that he had to go and check out. And it was like the 70s in New York, and it was on Madison Avenue. I think it was like in the 80s between Madison and Fifth, like basically around the corner from the museum. And uh, the people at the bank had said to him, you have to go in and look at the building. And the building was for sale for like somewhere around $400,000. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. my mother-in-law said, we actually could have like probably scrounged up a down payment to buy that. Yes. And I have to imagine that that $400,000 five-story townhouse in the 80s is probably worth 
I don't know, $15 million now? Does yeah. that sound fair, Mark, about that? At least, Mark say. <laughs> so I could have really married into some wealth. You could have. You wouldn't be working today. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> Liz Weston, pilot, financial <laughs> journalist, certified financial planner, an all-around amazing human being, writes at NerdWallet. We will link to your stuff. Any new books you're working on? Oh, no. It, that's like childbirth. It, it, you're done? It's too fresh. You yeah, did five. <laughs> How do you have childbirth? You only have one kid in five books. Exactly. That's, so it's like you've got a Brady Bunch of capacity, six. <laughs> that, and and that's it's all it. fulfilled. I've hit, I've hit it, definitely. You've done. It's not fun. It is it. It's not fun to not, write a book. Not, no, not doing it. Well, when it's done, it's great, but not, not doing it. All right. Well, will you promise to come back? I would love to. Thank right. you, Jill. Anytime, anytime you are actually on the East Coast, we want you right here. All right. Thank you. Liz Weston, you're the best. Thank Thank you. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for our favorite part of the program. It is the listener question of the week. And remember, you've got two shots at getting on the air with us. Two shots, not one, but two. Every Tuesday, we do the Better Off bonus call of the week. Then on our longer show, we do this this feature, which I love. And remember, uh, I am a certified financial planner. I'm now the senior CFP board ambassador, which means that I like answering your questions, but I can only do it if you send us your questions. Send us an email, ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. So we are on the line right now with Richard. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the program. What can we do for you? Well, first off, I want to tell you that I absolutely love this podcast. i just found it like a week ago after listening to NPR, and I binged through, I think, about every single episode. You are so nice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. We're working hard, so we got, I'm, I'm glad that you where you hear us. I don't even care, but I'm delighted that you found us. My question is, I've just, in the last six months, have really started taking uh, my retirement savings seriously. Um, well, when I first started working... I, I kind of was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll worry about retirement later down the road. I don't, I don't need to add anything to my 401k. Mm-hmm. And then it just hit me like, you know what? I do not want to end up like my father or my grandfather who will be probably working till the day they die. I need mm. to start putting stuff away now. My wife's uh, mother, um, she works for Edward Jones. She wants us to um, open up a Roth IRA with Edward Jones. Mm-hmm. Um I don't want to be pressured into opening an account if I, I don't know if it's if it's worth it if putting it there because um, I guess she has this family benefit where we don't have to pay any fees or if it would be just better to go with something like Betterment or Vanguard. Okay, so here's let's go back for a second. Um, so how much do you and your wife make together? Uh, together we make about seventy thousand right now. Okay, and do you guys have any debt like school loans or credit card or auto loans? Um, I have about 31000 in in uh, student loans. What's the interest rate on it, Richard? Um, there's, it's, it's five combined. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. The most expensive one is like 9%, and the lowest is like 4.5. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And right now, you said you've got a 401k at work? Uh, yes. And does your wife have one as well? Uh, no, she nannies. Okay, got it. Um. So are you putting any money into your 401k right now? Right now, just 5%. But I'm, I'm planning on once we kind of knock down some more debt, um, keep raising it up to like 10, 15. All right, great. Um, how's the cash flow? I mean, if you're making 70 grand a year, do you have extra money? What beyond the 5% you're putting into your 401k? Uh, yes. You do? Great. Yes. Okay. I presume what you're doing with that I'm gonna not, I'm gonna presume because he sounds kind of smart, uh, is that you're knocking down that nine percent debt first, right? You're gonna. So here's what we want: we want you to say, okay, here's how much money I have. Let's say on an average month you've got a, I don't know, three four hundred dollars left over. Then what I would like you to do is whatever that surplus amount is, whatever you've identified as, here's my money that I have available. Use that to pay down your student loan debt, going from the highest interest to the lowest interest. Okay. Okay. Now, once you get that done, and let's say that, let's say the lowest interest is now you're you're dealing with some of the stuff that's you know five, four, three percent loans. If there's anything like that, then you can you don't have to accelerate it. 
at that point, that extra money is what you're going to use to put into your 401k. The 401k, by the way, where is it held? Is it a big brokerage house? Is it a... Um, It's held at Charles Schwab. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to get you off the hook with your mother-in-law also. Because you don't even have to make a decision. What you're going to do immediately is you're going to say to your mother-in-law, oh, my God, thank you so much. But I spoke to a certified financial planner and she told me that I shouldn't actually put money into a Roth IRA just yet, that I'm going to work on whittling down my student debt. Then once that debt is down below a certain amount, like below 5% interest rate, then I'm going to put more money into my 401k because my 401k through work is really affordable. So I don't even think of, I don't need to open up a Roth IRA for a while. Thanks so much, mom-in-law. I'll talk to you in a few years. And then you're punting with her. This is also a good way to just sort of delay this big decision anyway, because it happens to be in your best interest. But it also is, it's weird to have that conversation. And I would prefer also that you would go to a cheaper alternative. But I don't even think you need to do that because you've got Schwab as your 401k plan. And it's probably has very good cheap index funds inside of that plan, doesn't it? Um, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think that the game plan is you and your wife whittle away at the student loan debt. I'm not going to make 9% return on your money. No one's going to make that on a consistent basis with no risk, right? You can make 9% in a year, but of course that that just means that you've taken a, you know, risk to do that. But paying down that 9% student loan, that gets you risk-free 9%. You just, boom, right to your bottom line. So I think that's what you should do. Delay the conversation with the mother-in-law. Do you call her mom or do you call her by her first name? Um, I call her by her first name. You know, I had a ex-mother-in-law who wanted me to call her mom. I thought that was weird. I know that that's like customary. Yeah, I thought that was a little weird. I know. Me too. Um, So you're going to pay down your student loan debt. First, Mark's laughing at me. He's like, stop talking about his mother-in-law. Pay down your student loan debt. Then you're going to put more money in your 401k. And then all of a sudden you're going to call me back and you're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm, I've got, you know, 15 percent in my 401k. Now, should I do a Roth IRA? And probably you should. And then we'll then we'll break the news to your mother-in-law. OK, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. And thanks so much for listening. I'm so happy that you discovered us. Well, thank you. I, I absolutely love the podcast. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks to Liz Weston, nerd wallet columnist and certified financial planner. And thanks to you for listening. Don't forget, we've got our bonus episode that comes out on Tuesdays and the longer form every single Thursday. You can subscribe via iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Jill on Money. That's at Jill on Money. Just use the hashtag better off. You can also reach me via email, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. And if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a review or a rating in iTunes. It really will help us out. Better Off is sponsored by Betterment. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio produces. I'm Jill Schlesinger. See you next week.